teaching role in Pakistani, Taranaki, and working for the advisory service at the <coughs> Professor Ka'ai is Hawaiian, or Palace Māori and Māori. Wow. And you'll hear a bit more of, um, of who comes before her in her presentation this morning. She completed her Master of Philosophy degree at the University of Auckland. Focus of her thesis was the transition of children from Te Kumanga Reo to school and Māori education in the 1980s. Her research focused on the preservation and revitalization of Te Reo Māori based on Māori parents' response to education, failing their education for over 100 years. It is used by Te Kumanga Reo National Trust as a resource for communities. She went on to complete her PhD at Waikato. Uh, at the University of Waikato. At AUT, she, Professor Tania is the director of Te Hikaria, the National Māori Language Institute, and the International Centre for Language Revitalisation. She, she yeah, shares her knowledge not only with students and staff at AUT and others nationally, but also internationally, having launched the United Nations Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues in 2011. After all that, we welcome you warmly to our little but wonderful group of teachers who are looking at doing action research around Neil Kukiarani and uh, we look forward to hearing your presentation. Thank you so much for the time you've given us today. Kia ora na tibi, kia ora na kutu katoa toa. Um, <laughs> It's a, it's a real honor to be joining you uh, via Zoom uh, this this morning. Um, um, today is a, um, a special day because it's my mum and dad's um, wedding anniversary. And um, so it's kind of like, uh, you know, they're with me as well. My dad is no longer with us, but my mum is. And um, so it's a very special day today for us as a, as a, um, as a nano, a whanau. Um, I wanted to also encourage you that uh, I'm so um, um, how would I delighted and amazed and um, and <clears throat> so encouraged by the work that you are doing um, at USP with with Debbie and her team um, in in the area of uh, of language and um, um, and I and I salute you today for for your resilience and for your commitment to uh, to learning into higher education because we never stop. Um, a little bit of uh, kind of taken aback by that introduction, Debbie. Um, you know, it's basically we're all, um, I think the most important thing to me right now in my life is being a grandmother. And um, uh, so um, of a three-year-old, so I think yeah, I see some arms being raised. I think that's an important um, uh, role in our lives, and um, and so it's taken me back to uh, to those the time when we really struggled to have uh, the establishment of Te Kuanga Reo um, as a uh, accepted as an early childhood learning centre in where our children are immersed in Te Reo Māori. as a human right. We have a have a have a right to our own language, so. Um, it's taken me back. She's been raised in, in Te Reo, and she will be the first native native speaker in our family that hasn't learnt it as a second language uh, in over a hundred years uh, since 1881, when my great grandfather great grandparents were uh, were born. So uh, mm -hmm. it's a it's a real achievement in terms of for us as a as a Fano a highlight for us as a Fano. Um, I wished in a way that we were, uh, had been in some ways raised in the Pacific when, you know, language is, is, a, is abundant and in, in, um, in the homes and on an island way, you know, remote from, from, uh, from, from any English speakers that would have made it a whole lot of e easier for mm -hmm. us to uh, maintain our language. So thank you for the honour or uh, the opportunity to join you at USP. Um, this morning, um, and um, I'm very, very honoured to be able to give back to um, to this community um, of my uh, of my grandmothers. 
and so and um so yes um i would like uh the the chance to um because of lack of time i can't get to know you um and uh have a what we call a hurirona where we can uh introduce ourselves but um uh because of time restrictions i would like the chance to for you to be able to ask me anything as we go through um the powerpoint um my, uh, my topic today is is um um is an area um, <coughs> my heart which is around um methodologies um and i guess i i went into this area especially with postgraduate students um to uh because our students our, our indigenous students we're really struggling to understand what a what is research and what is methodology and so i wanted to put a spin on it um where it just deconstructed it just you know unpacked all of those um those those ideas of qualitative versus quantitative and and let's let's simplify it and um but also look at what we have right in front of us that we can um, we can you utilize in our own studies to anchor our research so you all have the the copy of the powerpoint and i'm going to share my screen now and um with you and go through each slide. And if you feel you need clarification or would like to comment or ask a question, please don't hesitate um, to ask, to stop me. If there's any use of words that you um, feel that um, uh, I use, and that's probably because it's just part of where I come from in that, in that university context, please stop me and, um, and ask for clarification as well. You know, no question is too small or too big. You know, we, we've got to address that's what we're about in learning. So, okay, so I'm going to share my screen now if I can do this. Um, let's look at this one here. Uh, <clears throat> Let's go back to the, put this on my other screen so we can. Bear with me for a minute. I'm just going to change things around so I can actually access the, the screen that I want, the PowerPoint that I want, actually want. <clears throat> Now let's go with that. Can you all see that? Oh, yeah. Okay, Kilda, Kilda. Um, okay, so. Um, Indigenous research methodologies, where, where, where do we start with that? The idea is to, uh, to tell you, you know, like for me, working in a university context for a long, long time now, um, the role of the Indigenous scholar like myself, um, we, we don't just come in and teach. Um, we have a role, responsibility to reclaim Māori knowledge, Māori ways of looking at the world, Māori epistemologies, um, Māori pedagogies, um, the way in which we learn and teach, um, not, not, not mainstream education, um, but, but our, our people, our, our, our community, you know, do we learn in the same way? Do we absorb information the same way as, um, as mainstream uh, New Zealanders in the, in this case for me 
cultural imperatives of language? What are the cultural implications? What are things like verbal, verbal, um, non-verbal communication that exists between us? You know, a nice story that um, when we were doing the work on the dictionary with um, uh, Papa Mapu um, uh, from Mauke, um, he, we found a word called tungo. And, um, and to, to illustrate that, he and Papa Tairi from Atu uh, raised their eyebrows, you know, they raised their eyebrows. And they said, I, I said, what, what was the, the researchers then? I was sitting away from them, but my, one of, my, my daughter was the researcher for, for working with um, the Moki um, group. And, and, he, and he said, oh, it was a way to pick up girls. <laughs> and I laughed, I laughed. I loved and it because you know that 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 word has has an action that if you don't know what that action is, um, then at outside of our community, and especially from another cultural uh, context, you have no way of picking up that girl or understanding the importance of, of when that word <laughs> is used. So, so I think that. That those things around, you know, those cultural imperatives, including things like nonverbal communication uh, and language within mainstream education, to reclaim all of these things and to to have to give them validity within our context, yeah, is an important um, part of 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 what I see as my role. Um, and the, and part of the the role is also to indigenize the academy and make the academy responsible to indigenous people's goals of self-determination and well-being. So, you know, as, um, as, as one of the realm countries, I know that, that the education system is in New Zealand, um, in, in the Cook Islands, originates from New Zealand. Curriculum, the way in which we can, um, our schools are constructed. Um, so, so, I can, I'm making an assumption here. So most of us would have come through that kind of education. But in these days, in, in the current times, it's really important for us um, to, to push and create new, way, new, new ways of looking at the world and to help, help the academy grow a sense of responsibility to our ways of doing things, you know, our ways of doing things. So I wanted you to start with that because I think that, um, you know, uh, this type of um, presentation is, um, is located and embedded in that philosophy that it's, that it's you know, my job to create um, improve understanding between um, Without, within the uh, within the university context, the tertiary setting, um, not just that. Whenever I've been a teacher in the classroom, you know, my um, my I want all children to learn, not just those who have uh, have been advantaged because they their homes reflect also the school environment. So that means being able to. Uh, speak the language to those children who have been raised in language to help them learn as a vehicle to help them learn. Um, any questions? No, we're nodding, moving on. Okay. So our origins, if we look around us and teaching Indigenous uh, research uh, methodologies, it's it's really, it's, that notion is, is embedded. We've got to start with our origins. Who are we? what's our identity and for you sitting in the beautiful cook islands uh covid free um very easy to to be able to uh to identify who you are what your identity is it helps us to understand our past our present and our future what drives us and our behaviors yeah so it defines our place in our communities and in the world. Um, and an example of that is, um, I had the really good fortune to be a couple of years ago now, 
um, to be asked by the Ministry of Foreign Affairs to travel as a part of a party of 10 to go to uh, London for a few days for the uh, opening of the Oceania exhibition. And, um, and now your, our very own Anthony uh, Turua was over there as well representing the Cook Islands. And, um, uh, and in the exhibition were beautiful archives of all, all of Oceania. Uh, from Hawaii, um, um, of course, Aotearoa, New Zealand, and there was uh, exhibit, an exhibit from uh, the Cooks, which had never been seen. It had been tucked away in the, ne I think, the Netherlands for years and years and years, decades. And uh, when well, Anthony told me that, um, you know, it's it's very likely that many of our people in the Cooks had never seen this. Um, and so it was a real um, spiritual moment to see her, uh, she's from Aitutaki, um, this wonderful piece um, that transcended time and place, that here was this beautiful piece, this beautiful ancestor um, coming to light and being seen by the world. In, in, in London at the exhibition. Um, and for me, that, that's uh, being able to be with Anthony as a, as a Cook Islander, you know, we were very honored. We could, we celebrated being um, Cook Islanders, even though there was only two of us at the time, um, in a global context through this magnificent piece of work that had been taken um, many, many moons ago. So, you know, our origins are really important wherever we are because it defines our place in the world. And they also are, are key to, to understanding our destiny, you know, our, our pathway forward. Questions, comments? My, I hope I'm not losing you. <laughs> so you know it's unfair for me to as a as a person to say well you know who are you you know and and um other than debbie introducing me with this wonderful um that very you know um i was very humbled to when when uh um when people introduced me so with so so much detail um for me, it's important that, you know, we understand, you understand where I come from and why I'm so passionate about this and how, if we understand our background and our culture, how it helps us to look inside to create research methodologies, which is where we're going to with this lecture. So I describe myself as, you know, he uri whakaheke nunga motere o te moana nui akiwa. And so from my mother's side, I have my Māori, um, tipuna, um, who are from two different tribes. Um, Nanny Agnes was from Ngāti Pro on the East Coast. And, and of course, we hear from a place called Tokomaru Bay, uh, where our a whare nui is called Te Hono Ki Rarotonga. And um, our, our tupuna, Apirana Ngata, Ta Apirana Ngata, he had some vision to name it that, to make sure that the connections to the Cook Islands and our origins were forever remembered um, by our, this community of, of my, my, my mothers and, and, and Nanny Agnes. And so it is, it is still remembered because we have a lot of uh, in, some intermarriage as well between mm -hmm. the, the cooks and um, Proti Williams was one of them and um, uh, Nimo Tuavera, another one with, with Auntie Dinah. So we have this this connection, you know, between um, this little community, this hapu um, called Te Fano Urua Taupare in Tokumaru Bay, and then she married my Kuroa from Ngaitahu, and you can see he's um, um, very fair, but he was uh, the first in our family. He, he rode his bike over the over the Canterbury Hills from a little place called Rapaki 
to what was called the Canterbury College uh, to get his his um, his degree, um, which was now Canterbury University. So he set the the the, the place very you know the, he set that example of education is important a long time ago. Remembering that these two are native speakers; those are the ones that were born in the 1800s. They are the ones that now my um, my mukopuna my Helani is the first native speaker since these two here. So it's taken a long time to, um, to achieve that. On the other side is my Hawaiian side and my Cook Island uh, and Samoan side. Um, it's uh, the, my Hawaiian side is where the Ka'ai name comes from. But the, the lovely lady on who I'm, is my grandmother, her name is Tuavivi Greg. She is a Greg from the Northern Cook Islands. And her father, her father was George Bicknell Greg. So um, she was raised on Fanning Island and her mother was Samoan. And mm -hmm. um, so that's where you get the, the mix. She fell in love with this wonderful composer or musician. And, um, and that's where my father um, comes from. So I claim that, that, that um, from her. So um, a bit of a fruit salad as people often, you know, joke about is real serious for me that this is um, he uri whakaheke no ngā mautere o te moana nui akiwa. Okay. And so we come down to, these are very old photos now um, of um, my father and I only had one daughter. I would have liked 10, but you know, that's, um, it didn't work out. You know, I have, um, uh, I'm a, um, she's a, the only mokopuna and now it's her daughter, Mahialani, who is, um, is the native speaker raised in Te Reo Māori. So, and this is her husband here, Dean, um, Dean Mahuta. Both of them have um, their doctorates and, um, and are nationally, national registered translators and interpreters of Te Reo Māori. They have their uh, registration. They gained that last year. So um, the deal is very important. The language is very important to us. Dean actually wrote her, all of his um, theses in Te Reo Māori, which you'll see. And Rachel wrote her um, honours and her masters in Te Reo Māori and her PhD in English. Um, there was a political reason for that. Oops, we're going, we're going on. Here we go. So that's uh, an introduction into my family and understanding the importance of intergenerational transmission of knowledge um, through stories and through whakapapa, genealogy, through um, uh, positioning uh, the language and um, in the right to language and the right to culture and the right to our worldviews um, um, throughout every generation so that it helps us position our, helps our children um, to understand why these things are important. So, so influences on my research journey, and this is not just all about Tania. It's uh, it's really to to say that um, as you move down this research journey, um, and as certainly as I move down this research journey, I I owe my achievements to the collective effort of others in my life. So everybody has contributed you know it's like raising a child you know it takes a village to raise a child well that's the kind of mentality that you know and i'm very i, I really believe in this um this um uh, because it takes um a huge number of people to help you on your journey and you must never forget forget them and so these are some of the people who have helped me. Two of them I know have been um, been with me um, on our trips to the Cook Islands for the dictionary, um, mainly uh, Sir Dr. Timo Tikaritu uh, and the late uh, Te Whariwia Milroy, who sadly passed um, a couple of years ago. John Hunia from uh, Ngāti Awa in Te Teko. Uh, he was my Māori language teacher um, at school, but also a great, great family friend. Uh, John Rangiho, who uh, we'll talk about um, as a person who developed, who inspired us at university to create our own 
methods, our own methodologies, who's passed um, the late Hirini Milburn, who revitalized um, uh, Maori music, traditional Maori music, um, and has left, uh, that is a legacy for us. And uh, Ngoi Pefairangi, who's a great aunt of mine, who, um, who was a composer and, um, and you know, passed the rako over to, to me to say, you have a job to do and go and do it. So, um, <clears throat> so, so all of us have these influences in our lives that, that contribute in some way to helping us understand either our origins or the stories that are important around culture and, um, and mātauranga Māori, Māori knowledge, um, that, you know, I've kept, maintained that relationship with for over many, many decades now, which showing my age. So what about, um, I talked about John Rangiho, and he, long time ago when I was at university in the 70s, created this model that he could talk about for sort of up to a week. And it looks very, uh, very flat model, um, but the way he described this model was very, um, very almost like a cube that you could look through it like a prism, yeah? And, um, and I, I won't go into each of the areas, but, but um, he said our, our reality, our reality in our world today is that uh, our culture, our world, our Māori world uh, is surrounded by, by Pākehā, Pākehā tanga, yeah, Pākehā culture. So mm -hmm. at the four corners, you can see that there are, that that's the like interface that we have um, with the Pākehā world. Inside of that, of course, from the, the four corners, inside of those four corners of Pākehā tanga, there are politics, Māori, arts and crafts, and tangihanga. And there, and it goes on right to, to the middle where he called this, you know, he's centered this model around the term uh, Māori tanga, which was a, 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 a coined word for um, the 60s, in the 70s, sorry, not the 60s. Um, but what he did was in framing this, it became this ideological model that he would use to, uh, to educate Pākehā, especially people in, in, uh, in Wellington, all the what I call the fish heads of our government uh, and, and government departments uh, to help uh, as a bridge to educating them. And it was also a bridge to, uh, to educate our own people in our communities to help understand that this is, this is what we must hold on to. This is what we must hold on to. Um, and we must uh, understand though that the importance that if the impact and the pressures brought about by an, uh, by mainstream culture, the dominant culture in Aotearoa, New Zealand. We have to be rigid at holding on to those things. So this became really, for me, the first kind of model of, uh, as an indigenous model that I use for my research and also teaching postgraduate students, including Cook Island students. And I'll show you that as we go through. So perspectives from, oh, sorry, just to catch up, just to check in. Are you okay? Are you all? I am. Uh, um, okay. um, so, so get along the way, um, you know, as, as um, we, we become scholars, we share perspectives. And some of these perspectives are important in, and how, and, and, and also be providing a rationale for, um, for why we should really look to creating our own methodologies. So I'm going to go through some of them and, and you may have others you want to, you know, suggest you add on to this list. These are just some of the ones I've pulled together for you. Um, and uh, scholars, indigenous scholars thinking it's really important to have, <coughs> recognize that there is an indigenous language, the place of indigenous language in our, in our, in our, world, in our work. Um, the recognition of different knowledge systems, including those from an oral tradition, such as Maori and Pacific cultures. 
because we have a very strong oral tradition. Um, and the participation of our elders as, reposit as repositories of knowledge, you know, um, that's a really critical one. It's not just our, our peers in the, in the classroom, but also those who we go to who in our communities have huge, are gifted with huge knowledge. Um, the fact that we observe indigenous research ethics, which is often very different from mainstream and, um, and that they have a place in the way in which we do research. A commitment to, um, to research that recovers our history. So sometimes we choose to do research, not just because the government has, you know, sent out a, um, um, a what we, you know, a tender uh, to, to us as researchers, to do research because they want answers to particular um, questions or, or, or problems. Um, for me, for me, I'm really driven by the fact that, you know, we, we, we have a commitment to recover our histories and rewrite them, you know, so uh, to reclaim our lands and resources, so research that does that, uh, restore justice, and preserve our language and traditions within a culturally specific framework. So, you know, there's not just, this, this is a, a, a sort of a collective, um, a collection of these views from a range of scholars in, um, in Aotearoa and the Pacific. We are beginning to utilize digital technologies in the archiving and dissemination of our knowledge. So for example, you know, how many, how, how often can we Zoom? When did Zoom come in and connect us? You know, technology is such an important um, uh, aspect of our development where we can share like this, where I can send the PowerPoint in an email and say to, to Debbie, please, please feel free to share this with your, with your students um, uh, as a way in assisting um, language in, this, in your development. So technology does have a place and we shouldn't be frightened of that, but we do need to have a sense of control, which is um, what I haven't got up here is data sovereignty, which is a very big issue now in, um, in the research world on who manages our data and, and our information, our knowledge, and what is and for what purpose. So, you know, that's something that's very critical to us and, um, and, um, and something relatively new that we've been, we're exploring. The recognition of the role that spirituality plays in research, that's so important. You know, um, uh, um, there are things that, that, that we believe in um, or that, that in our world uh, that inform us. Um, that, uh, that I want to talk, talk about, more specifically, probably when I talk about Charles Carlson's um, um, Koka model that he used in his research for his masters, but you know those those things that are that are are environmental things that are signs, a tohu. You know, um, what is it that when we go to if we do we go to the reef um, out to the reef to collect um, limu when uh, the the ocean is rough? You know. Those sort of signs that in, in, that are that make us uh, understand um, our environment, and also I think that spiritual relationship that we have uh, with the ocean and with you know harvesting um, that guide our and inform us. So that's a really important aspect of the way in which um, that the spirituality plays in research. Uh, this is a big one for me, the next one, a commitment to the collective interest and well-being of the community. You know, research must benefit the, the, well, the community. How, you know, and if it doesn't, it's like, oh gosh, and research methodologies must also um, be created to benefit the community. It can't be, it must be in a state of air, which is like balance. You don't have research that just is benefits the crown or it has to benefit the crown and the community. You know, it can't just be a one-sided one, one -sided thing. 
And then, of course, the other three, relationship between academic studies and the real world, um, um, understanding and respecting respect for the indigenous worldview that we, you know, we come from different worlds. Um, I was at a place yesterday with young children and there was one Pākehā child there who was at a kindergarten. It was one Pākehā child there. All the rest were from different, had, spoke different languages, were, were combinations of children from a Scottish back, a, a child from a Scottish and Chinese background, um, a child who was from uh, a Russian child. They all had these, um, uh, while they were playing together, they all had different languages and ways in which I'm sure they, they view the world through, um, through their parents' language, through their, um, the food they eat. So, you know, we have to respect the Indigenous worldview in our research. And of course, traditional ways of constructing, organizing and using knowledge. You know, whose knowledge do, whose knowledge um, and how to, and, and, and who has the, and, and the power behind that choice of cons whose knowledge we, uh, is being used. Are we okay? All right. So what I'm going to do now is, is to go on to, to show you then. This is a model, very simple. It has a, it has a, um, uh, an explanation of each of those, uh, those triangles. But this is a PhD thesis. This is my son-in-law, Dean, uh, who wrote his, um, his whole thesis in Te Reo Māori. Uh, mm -hmm. And it was the first at AUT, um, and he wrote about his uh, the river, the the Waikato River. Um, he anga ranga home more Waikato. It's his people, and so you can see he's chosen a um, a visual representation of that model um, with key words that uh, that he defines how that model works. But basically. Um, the model is his, his mountain, which is a spiritual mountain, which is Topiri. And of course, at the top of that is the Kingitanga. Uh, in the left hand corner is Raupatu, which is confiscation that, is, they've, uh, that the tribe experienced over many generations. And then the Tupuna Awa on the other uh, lower right hand side, which is the, his Waikato River. And in, in those little squares, um, uh, different um, words that that he explores to uh, in his explanation of how that model works um, and that are specific to um, to his thesis and uh, I thought that was a, a very simplistic way model to start with um, to show you um, and of course you can source this um, from and you'll probably be able to uh, to understand it because he writes in te reo. And so with obviously you're all native speakers of the language <laughs> and um, you would probably enjoy reading something it's in the language and, uh, and the way he writes. So it's a good resource for you. Um, again, he, he used this, uh, the colors, I said, um, you know, he chose colors that are specific, the, the blue and, and gold. And I said to him, oh, what are those colors? And he says, Oh, that's my rugby league colors, my rugby league club colors from from when he was a child um, and lived in, and grew up. And I thought, fair enough, fair enough. That's that's. Uh, and he explains that all in in his um, explanation to to why this was so important for him and guided his his thesis and his writing. Uh, this is now um, Rachel, um, my daughter's. She did uh, this. She called hers her the Tienga model. Uh, tienga is a a form of fariki, a very finely woven mat um, that was used before um, uh, men went to battle. And uh, so um, Tienga is is a way in which she used. Um, the Rangiho model, and so did Dean, is a point of being able to, as a prism, to go through the arts and crafts, particularly this one, arts and crafts area, and um, and into developing her own model, which um, depicts uh, her thesis, which is all about 
Wayata song and um and haka Wayata and, and haka is um political commentaries of our past so she's com she's arguing that all of these compositions of um of Wayata and um and haka are um contain important um landmarks and history historical information which shows that um that that these are that the place of Waiata in our in our culture, and so uh, for her, all of those words that go across the, the weft and the warp. Uh, for those of you who may also be weavers, um, she's in, introduced words there that are critical to understanding um, her her the focus of her thesis, Tienga, and of course she actually talks about. Um, how Tienga, she goes back to talk about the Atua, the deities. Um, you know, some people translate that as gods, we translate it as deities um, who are uh, guardians of our, um, you know, like Tangaroa um, of the ocean and so forth. So these sorts of things are important um, to us. And she goes back to, um, to talking about the oral narratives of, um, the genealogy of these, where where Wayata comes from, what domain, um, what 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 was the story that backgrounded this? You know, like the fine arts come from Niwareka and Mataura, and so you know those stories are really important um, that uh, that lead and and are implicit in these research models. This is from Gloria Taituha. She, I thought I would throw in some uh, an MA thesis as well. She's from Ngati Maniapoto in the uh, King Country, in uh, from a place called Pio Pio, but Tequiti you might know as well, south of Hamilton, and uh, she used um, Te Kauo o Maro model, and in she's a weaver, and so. Um, he developed this 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 model several several um, uh, uh, diamonds put together, uh, and based on um, Riwi her, her ancestors Riwi Mania Poto's um, argument that you know we will we will uh, we will fight to the end you know in terms of fighting the constabulary in the past um, who were trying to confiscate their land. Sorry. And so she, she's got a huge explanation behind that. And each one of those words is if you're weavers, you may be interested in, it relates to some aspect of weaving. She, for her artifact, she did her thesis or exegesis, uh, she made a korowai from muka, uh, which is the um, part of the harakeke plant, the flax plant. So she made this beautiful feather, you know, um, uh, cloak, uh, kākahu, and um, uh, and that and that kākahu is based on this model. She got to this, you know, she was able to develop this model to uh, to help her um, to locate her her research in. So yeah, this is going to be more familiar to you. Um, when I had the good fortune of being invited to come by um, Bobby and um, Rod Dixon to USP to talk about um, indigenous research methodologies several moons ago, we talked. Uh, we took the uh, the students that I took uh, taught at that time um, were interested in uh, in taking the John Rangiho ideological model and putting over the top what it would look like for, uh, for as a Cook Island model. And so people like Mike Tavioni, Charles, um, who else was there? Um, Diane, Charlie, Puna, um, um, trying to think of the others, all came through with, with they had this huge discussion around what would those Terms be, and so this is what they pulled together, and this is what they have. They also used for their own research, was a way in which they could frame their own research. And I, you know, I, I was just it was really a fascinating experience as a teacher. You know, I'm also a learner. That the discussion 
um, in English and in and in Te Reo, uh, of of what names they would use um, to dis to describe some of these things that are uh, a part of defining um, Cook Island culture, language and culture. So um, again, this is something. <coughs> It is a resource. Um, they used it for their own research. And so you've got people like Charles who used uh, the banana tree. He was somebody, oh, sorry, someone was got a question. Yes. Excuse me, Tanya. We were just talking about the sorry, I'm Ara Shio. We are a little we were just talking about. First word, Akapa, can you translate that word? Um, Explain. Make it more clear for us, if you don't mind. Is it Akapa or Samago? Yeah. Yes, that, that's the word that they gave it. That's the word that they gave it. Or any, how would you translate it to English anyway? I don't know. I, I, from my understanding, I, uh, I'm thinking, thinking that maybe this, the structure of the model or a name given for this model. This is the name that they, the students gave to this model. But what I mean is we have, we do have our own um, definition of that, we, our own Cook Island, um, what is the translation of that? like putting it in rows or yeah, systematic order. Do you know what I mean? It's not only yeah. I, 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 um, maybe if uh, whatever right. the writing in the box was a little bit thicker, then maybe we can understand actually what yeah. this model is about. No, never mind that. Right. Right. You'll be able to see it in the open world. You know, oh. you know right. this model here. What they did was they put used this model as a basis and they just overlaid each of those areas um, because uh, with with um, uh, Cook Island languages. And of course, you know, there was variation to discussion around, um, you know, island, which one was was the, you know, they some of them were from Atu, like, um, uh, and they would prefer to use the Atu, um, the Achi term, but this is what they ended up with as a generic kind of model that was reflective of this model. Uh, yeah. yeah. As a way to try and. Sorry. Sorry. It's, it's, no, it's, it's what I'm saying is that it's not really a problem. It's pretty good. Okay. Okay. Um, Thank you. You're welcome. You're welcome. I like this because, you know, this is, reminds me, it took me straight back to when we were actually in class and we said, well, let's have a, let's do this. Let's workshop some of these terms. Um, and uh, because they were interested in the Rangiho model. So, yeah. And so this is, can I move on to Charles's work now to show you? Are we already, are we okay to move on? Move. Yeah. Okay. okay so, Charles was a person who has, was educated in New Zealand because he moved to New Zealand as a young boy. He's come home and he was um, really trying to come to terms with how would we go from that akapaanga model to, de to develop something that was relevant to his research um, uh, for his masters. And so he came up with, I said, it can be, a, you know, a visual representation of, it uh, could be the breadfruit, it could be, and of course he's come up with the banana tree, yeah? And so he, this is his sketches, this is, this is his working uh, from a draft of his thesis. 
And what he then helped, helped him was to talk about in Cook Island language, what that looks like. Merupirupi te tupu o te meika ka, ka mako ua tatau. And then in English, when the banana trees look healthy, we should be okay. And he was looking at um, uh, management of weather systems, yeah? And it occurred to him that, you know, when you've got instrumentation across the islands, you know, when there, were no, when there was no instrumentation like we have today, how did we know where the cyclone was coming? You know, and our people are smart. Our people are, are smart and they still use that knowledge today. So what he wanted to do in attempt was to say, okay, we have instrumentation, but what about to validate the, the, uh, um, the, the, the work of our, our knowledge, our knowledge systems that we have in place that should be recognized in, as, as instruments in themselves, yeah? And so when he, he came, he, he further went on to describe, when we stay firm on our Papa Māori and stay connected to our atua through the vibes of our, of our Pe'u Māori, we will enjoy the fullness of life. And he grabbed that quote from uh, Ron and Marjorie um, Prokem, and then he created his model. He went down and he said, you know, the same thing. Uh, when the stalk of the banana tree twists, we will have a cyclone. Yes. And then he backed it up with his um, with his research again by um, Papa Ron and, and Mama Marjorie. When there is confusion in our Papa Māori and our Pe'u Māori, we then become distorted in our identity as Cook Islands Māori people. <laughs> so, you know, this is marvellous, marvellous work that there is this taking uh, of 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 knowledge, and um, and using language as well. When the stalk of the banana tree bends, we will have a cyclone. It is also known that the direction the stalks bend to will be the direction of the cyclone. How, our people are amazing. They looking at these sorts of things over huge time to to help us survive as a people in the middle of the ocean. We're just truly amazing. I love this, this, um, this, the magic of this knowledge. And he, you know, I could, you can look at this at your own time because I know time is getting on, but all of these, all of these works, because you have the, you have this now as a PowerPoint for your own resource. But the point that I'm making is that he he was so courageous because he left um he had already you know looked at uh at international research around uh weather systems and uh disaster management and all of those things that are that have been written in journals and academic um uh um articles um from all over the world but what he did for his research at the same time was look at what we have as gems within our own knowledge systems. And I and I have to, you know, salute him for that. Because he created out of that, he has created a model that other people like yourselves, if it's if it works, um, if it's a fit, can cite that it's our own models that we're creating uh, to make sense, uh, to contribute to the academic environment. Diane was the same. Um, her model is Kete Uraanga model, and the, you see the she has a, um, a uh, the flower of the mimosa as well. Um, it was sensitive. Her area was um, uh, traditional adoption, and um, and looked at how you know um, mainstream adoption. Is um is in the tensions between, and so when she, uh, the mimosa flower, she explained it in her model, um is sensitive because when you touch it, it closes. Yeah, you'll all know this. I'm I'm speaking to people who already know this information, and she she used that because um when she interviewed her her um 
her people who were informants, her participants of her research, um, often it's a sensitive matter. And so there would be, there would be sharing of moments that they were very sensitive. And so she wanted to, to show how sometimes adoption can be sensitive and uh, through her model, which is, uh, includes the mimosa flower. Uh, again, that's a, a that's a um, a thesis that you should, you know, these two theses are, are are important resources for you. How are indigenous methodologies used, not just in terms of research, but in terms of this is uh, my work now, um, the mahitahi model. It's around how we supervise, and um, so. Um, you can see that with the image of tukutuku patterns, you have the weaving um, of uh, the patterns of person behind the board and in front. And they have to work together. You can't do tukutuku on your own. You're reliant upon each other to ensure the uh, creation of the art, art form. And that's how uh, mahitahi, um, that's a, 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 a a way in which I can describe mahitahi model, a collaborative learning, that in supervision, it's really a collaboration. It's not a, um, and that's very different from in mainstream education where, collab where um, the Western model is often where uh, the supervisor has the power um, and, um, the, and, the, and, the, and the student is, you know, insubordinate to, to that person. Uh, this, is more about collaboration, um, uh, working together, um, where it, you're the expert, you come with expert knowledge in a particular area, and, um, uh, and the supervisor is someone who can help guide through the journey um, of understanding, you know, that you need to perhaps strengthen um, your writing in a particular area with more, uh, more readings, um, and so forth. We, it's, it's a collaboration together. You weaving through this, this PhD or master's journey. And so we've got a, a bit of a model down there. Um, uh, so indigenous methodologies can be used in a range of, of different things. Again, um, it can be used in publishing um, as well. Um, when I wrote the book about that, that great aunt of mine, Ngoi Pe Whairangi, um, she was an, invited by the, the fam family to do so. I used um, different ways of collecting information, like wānanga. Wānanga to us is, okay, we went to the marae, uh, we had a whole four days there, we invited people to come from all over the country um, to come and share their stories and stay with us for that time, and they did. Um, so they shared their stories, their photos, their vignettes. They, we interviewed them on, on, on film, but it was a wānanga approach. It wasn't me going all around the country to interview people individually. Some of them also chose to be interviewed not just on their own, but as, as a whānau, as a collective. Um, all of her friends, her female friends from Hukurere, for example, those who turned up, they wanted to be interviewed together. So there's different ways of, you know, of gathering data that we that we feel more comfortable with that come from from our ancestors. You know, they did this. They when they wanted to uh, solve a problem, they got together and talked about it. Um, also, the use of te reo Māori when undertaking interviews. You know, it doesn't have to be in English. It can be in Māori, and you don't have to translate it either. Um, and I, I didn't in the final published work, you know, and that's the risk I take um, um, not to translate, um, you know, the, the publishers um, may not, well, may, may not like that, but I was, um, I was explained to them the importance of keeping the real in the real. And also, you know, adopting a particular writing style that reflects who we are and, 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 and my choice was to locate myself as a storyteller rather than um, he did, she did, you know, this is what happened as a, like a historian. I wanted to be a storyteller and, um, and also allowed the voices of, of those people who, who gave generously of their own stories for their voices to be heard. 
So again, indigenous methodologies, the way in which we do things in our own world, we can do that in, in, in publishing as well. Um, you know, um, I've had the good fortune to have traveled um, with as an academic. And one of my travels took me to um, uh, to southern the southern states um, to different conferences, and I was able to go visit a museum. And um, there was this. I was. I asked if I could take the photo of this, and I could see that. Oh my gosh, these uh, these Native American Mojave elders program. This quote came from that. And the mess quite is a, is, a, is a tree that survives in the desert. And I took a photo of this because it shows that the fact that we are looking to our own cultures to, to help define our world and inform us um, is, is, is universal, it's global. And so, you know, the mess quite it says here is our life. It's a tree that survives in the desert. When you are born, it cradles you. They take the they take the bark from the tree and make a make a, a, a an indigenous um, cradle for the baby. Okay. Through your life, it feeds and shelters you. So it shelters you in in the middle of the desert, and it also feeds you in terms of the bark and the um, and the um, the fruit from the tree. And when you die, it takes you home. So they use the tree to build their fire. To, um, to put their um, bodies, their, their ancestors on, on to, and to, to send them home. So, you know, this is, these sorts of sayings and uh, a part of, you know, the Mesquite has become a methodology to some of these Mojave people who are like you, sitting in a classroom trying to make sense of indigenous methodologies. I thought that might be a nice way of you to think beyond the Pacific. <clears throat> so some help we're nearly finished helpful tips in undertaking research you've probably heard this already engage the community from the outset you know you have to be and you there can't be a, 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 a dislocation a detachment but from community between community and the academy and um, from what I can see USP is is just so strong in this in this um, in this area, um, research must have mutually beneficial outcomes, not just for the researcher, but for the community. And that's what I talked about. It has to benefit all of us, yeah? Our, our people, not just me as Tanya, who happens to be a member of, you know, the Cook Island community, and but not just me, Tanya, in, as a researcher. The research design must reflect you, the appropriate methodology. So we must have, you know, things like dautu to for us, that's reciprocity, and manaki, which is, you know, caring, caring for the scopapa, caring for our community, being caring for the way in which we write, and and how we write that benefits is careful of our community. Um, we must be seen in the community. Kanohi kitea, you know, hard for me being here. COVID, I was due to come over last year. Um, we had everything all sorted and we were coming over to um, to meet and and talk about the dictionary and um, to, to forecast the years to come. But COVID hit and everything stopped. So, um, you know, I tried to get back to the cooks to do, to be seen, but, um, you know, it's hard when these, these uh, awful pandemics um, separate us. But indeed, we, you know, we have to be seen in the community. That's the point. And we must also have um, all sources and informants must be acknowledged. You know, I, I, I think that it's really uh, sometimes in the past, we've had academics come into our communities. They take knowledge from us, but they never acknowledge you, the people, us, the people. So, you know, we don't want to follow those mistakes and we want to be empowering of our people. I know when I got my PhD, um, one of my nannies, um, Nanny Nunu, who was um, the teacher at the local kura, we'd started from nothing. She just, um, and she was lovely. Um, she took my, carried my thesis around with her 
in her kite, even to the shop, and she'd sit out on the bench in front of the shop and talk about it. Say, so have you had a look at this? This is who I am. This is the work that we do in our kura. You know, she, she, it, it became her life. You know that that I would dear, and she would point to her name. You know, there's, there's, there's me. You know, I'm in this book. It was really important to her um, as a as part of a member of the community. <laughs> And also the recognition of, of koha, you know, kai, a voucher, those sorts of things are really important when we ask people to participate in our work. We give, we give um, as well. And, you know, for me, I gave all my informants um, a bound copy of my thesis. So it's always about trying to maintain air, you know, that balance. Um, all of these things you can read at your leisure now, with only two slides to go. Key cultural markers that are really important that, you know, are drivers of, 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 of research. Um, you can, um, you can, they're listed here. Um, and I want to acknowledge really that there are a myriad of, of voices, indigenous voices, all over the world, some of these people are alive today, some of them not alive, but have left legacies of their own kind with us. And one of the people who I really have uh, been inspired by is, um, is an academic I want to leave with you today, is Epele Hawofa, who said, we should not be defined by the smallness of our islands, but the greatness of our oceans. We are the sea, we are the ocean. Oceania is us. Ina tate, mei taki mata. So, do you have, I'll just um, stop sharing my screen and um, come back to you, the important people of this world at this moment in time, <laughs> and ask you, is this, is there anything that you would like to ask me? You want me to clarify? I know we're over time, but you know, time is, um, how would I say this? Time is when the sun rises and the sun sets. And we have indigenous ways of looking at the world as well in terms of time. Do you have anything that, did I lose you? Or are there, did this, was this helpful? If it wasn't, then I need to slap my own hand. I have one question. Maybe I'll be a bit of a question for you. Um, what was your, you know, biggest challenge when you were doing your research? What was... My biggest challenge, um, I think, when, when I was doing my master's, and... Um, there was no indigenous supervisor for me. And so I went with a very lovely person. Uh, my supervisor was a lovely person. Um, but I, but, and of course I just had my baby as well. Um, oh no, I was hapu and then, um, then she was born. Um, but I felt that I had to educate my supervisor around peu Māori, yeah, um, uh, kaupapa Māori, mā, mātauranga Māori, to help them understand uh, what, what I wanted to do with my thesis. That was the challenge. And I think that was very exhausting for me because, you know, I could see other students could would come in and get, you know, have quality time and be able to write a thesis. I wanted to write about Kohanga Reo and that transmission, yeah, of from Kohanga to, to school. Well, no, you know, nobody knew about Kohanga. I was able to get in there because of Auntie Iritana and the Kohanga Reo Trust who knew me and um and so it was very new new research. The the struggle I had was um, with with the time it took to educate, 
to then, you know, to keep going backwards and forwards, um, talking about, you know, Bronfen Brenner's scaffolding concepts like that, um, theorists that were, you know, uh, saying that the home and the school should be the same to make the easy transition, having to deal and go backwards and forwards and educate. And that was really time consuming, uh, exhausting. And, you know, I was still feeding my baby. So you can imagine the kinds of pressures, yeah? Um, I vowed and declared, I don't think that any of our people should have to go through that, that when I was in a position to supervise, that I, 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 wanted, I wanted people to find a match, yeah? Find a, to increase, to increase people um, in the academy who could be supervisors. And so that they, we increase the opportunity for people like yourselves to find a supervisor where there was, they didn't have to educate me. Yeah, mm -hmm. they were already, they, we were on the same <clears throat> level. And we, 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 just, we could discuss things from our a common worldview. And I think that was the hardest thing for me. I vowed mm -hmm. and declared that would never have to happen. I would never, I would never, want that to happen I would want it to change that so and I think I have uh, successfully helped uh, do that by ensuring policies uh, in the university that we have the right to to um, to write in te reo Māori um, <laughs> in all Dean wrote all of his work in te reo Māori all of his work and we did that through creating a policy and through ensuring, you know, that the, it, the academy couldn't, you know, it was watertight, yeah, it was watertight. So, um, so yeah, that was the hardest for me. I wish that never had never happened. Okay, Tanya, the other question I'd like to ask is that did you get any negative feedback from your peers or from your colleagues that you were doing your research or even after completing? Your Sorry, research. there's an echo there. I just can you just say that again? Sorry, I. My negative kind of that was question is: Did you get any negative comments from other scholars as you were going through your your research? Um. Um. No, not. Not really. Not I didn't really get negative comments. Um, Disagreements. Yeah. Well, I think I I would put. Um, I think we had uh, very full and and um, discussions that were around. Um, uh, particular things, you know, like a cultural lens that I would see things this way, and um, and and they may see things differently. Non-indigenous people were, um, of course, you know, they just didn't have that same lens. Um, you know, uh, there weren't many of us around it doing masters that were indigenous. <laughs> In my, in my field at the time it was a pretty lonely uh, journey to make. Um, but I think I put that in a, in a context of, you know, robust discussion is very different from disagreement, yeah? And, mm -hmm. you know, like I gave you the example of Charles, uh, that, that, that group of um, Cook Island students that we were, when I came to, to talk about uh, indigenous research methodologies, and they were discussing the the model, how they want they could you know the words, the terms. They said, "Ah, oh, I don't know if that means that. Uh, this could it could mean this. This is means this is what it means to to us." Um, and they and they found a common common ground, you know. And so to me, that's really robust discussion. Discussion, healthy. It's good to disagree, but also it's good to to know. Okay, it's not working necessarily now, but we could find something else that. It's middle ground. Yeah, so yeah. I hope you know. Isn't it that you, there's a whole lot of new learning happens because you are having to justify and think about your answers. And so, you know, that robust discussion is how you learn and it helps you to think 
and consider other alternative ideas and then and then decide whether your original idea was actually strong enough to stand on its own, right? Tanya? Yes, yes. And I think one of the things, Debbie, I can hear you say is, you know, back yourself. Back yourself. If this is something as practitioners, as practitioners, um, as, as people of a community, um, you know, back yourself no matter what. If you, and don't be, don't be afraid to move, in, to move forward, you know, don't be afraid um, to, to argue the point if you can do that really well. The idea is to do that really well. Um, you know, a class, a, an example of that is, I know uh, there's a discussion around historical cultural trauma uh, for children, for generations of Maori children because of colonization of the education system. And so, so some people at, at an, at a, in the academy say, there's no such thing. I've heard, I've heard people, there's no such thing as cultural trauma. That's, a, that's, that's just a myth. And yet, and so people, are, you know, in their writings come back and say, and quote this person, quote this person, you know, so-and-so said there's no cultural trauma. Um, evidence to this is da 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 da, -da. So they actually, um, you know, bring that, that, cite that person, and then they argue against that. It's, that's the, what you do, and you do inside of, um, and, and that's the beauty of writing, to be able to bring it into into the fore, not just keep it on the out uh, outside of the discussion, bring the, that argument into your discussion and then refute it if you don't agree with it. If that's any other questions? Uh -huh. um, my point here is when you. Um, uh, my point here is, uh, you know, when you see about um, those uh, pieces that are written fully in my language, yes. uh, you know, looking at other people who are searching for the church, and uh, like myself, if I had to come and search the literature and come up with those uh, pieces. How would I, you know, get to know the you know the meaning of what's been written? Do you have other um books in, in English that you know we can um, use at the same time to get a meaning of what you have in your language? Well, um, yes, there is a, I mean, I, I can, um, you know, we've, we've set a trend um, when I was at Otago and then of course now, and, and we've maintained that at AUT, um, there is a trend of Māori writing their thesis in Te Reo Māori. So mm -hmm. what I will do is I will ask my um, very, very good executive administrator, Tanya Smith, um, to uh, maybe put out a uh, search for um, the thesis that have been developed and articles that have been written in Te Reo Māori that we could send to you as a as a reading list if you want as a you know um, if that's helpful. Sorry, yes. Tanya, um, when you say Te Reo Māori, is yes. that New Zealand Māori language Māori. only? Okay. Um, is there anything because I heard you before when you were saying that you have in the academy, that you have um, written policies and you were able to successfully um, wrote those policies where indigenous um, knowledge in Te Reo Māori is acknowledged you know, there, the academy. So my, I'm just wondering, is the Cook Islands Māori part of that language? No, it's not. And... Um, no, 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 that's a very good point and a very telling point because um, uh, when Cook Island Māori is considered as part of the Pacific, yeah? So when I've argued, well, actually, you know, um, historically, using our worldview, actually, we've come from the Cooks and, you know, we, you know, there, there's, yeah, but in terms of a, a Western worldview, 
and the way in which education is is structured, the cooks are are in the Pacific, which they they um it's sad because it, for me I don't break that up. I see Maori as an extinction as an island as part of the Pacific, but unfortunately the rest of the world doesn't do that, and so I think there is a, a um, there is a a time in which um, we could argue the fact that you are citizens of New Zealand and the realm countries that we have an obligation to support language and so therefore we should have the opportunity to be able to, to write in Te Reo Māori Cook Island, well, you know, um, Te Reo Māori Cook Island when I'm talking about that in, in Te Reo. The issue that will always be asked is who can examine these species in Te Reo? And that's the issue, see? That's the main issue in the argument that's been put that I have not, uh, you know, I have to respect in terms of I don't have an answer for that yet. So going of those, sorry, sorry, both of you as masters and, 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 and people who are in the system and the growth of people like Ake um, and uh, who, who can be an examiner in Te Reo. Uh, maybe it's a time now to say, um, who else? Who else is there? You know, let's grow this cohort of Pacific people, of Cook Islanders, who actually can um, assess, you know, um, uh, in Te Reo Māori. And, and they don't have to be a, uh, in a university either. We could argue that position. Sorry, Debbie, I just wanted to finish that. Yeah. Sorry. Sometimes you think it's finished and then it's not on Zoom. I think one of the things that this paper is showing us is the amount of Cook Island techniques that are around that we haven't really tapped into. And I think that that's one of the exciting things is that in, the, in this diploma, these students have been submitting their, uh, all their assessments in Māori. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so fabulous. Why would we not just do that, right? Yeah. Um, like you said, we've got to design the diploma and she can mark in, in Māori, but we do want to grow that. But we do have people like Professor uh, John Johnson, and we do have other activists we know all, that can you know, mark in Māori, and yeah. um, I think we should normalise that. And I think what happened in New Zealand because of the Treaty of Waikanae, yeah. with the fact that there is two, two languages of New Zealand, and that's why the middle Māori is absolutely 100% fundamentally mm -hmm. important that people uh, submit anything from school or you know, primary, secondary, NCA should be able. They should be able to choose one of those languages. No, not just in the yeah. Yeah. So yeah, that was my idea around. Yes, we're getting there. We're going to grow these academics. Yes, like you. I think we've got another question down the back of that. So like, sorry. Oh, sorry, that's fine. So it was just a comment to add on to what you talked about because I was surprised we had to. Develop policies so that New Zealand Māori, so that work could be submitted in New Zealand Māori, because in my experience at the University of New Zealand, I had students that wrote their work in Māori and submitted it. I, did, I thought that was actually as part of legislation in the national language of the country. That has not always been the case. And, yeah. um, you know, uh, we introduced that um, uh, policy in 1996 at Otago University. And it was the very first in the country. And from there, other other Maori in other universities like Massey then asked asked to ask asked for us to share the policy and said yeah. And so they fought for that as well. So it was not had been a recognised in terms of a, a form of assessment and writing theses and in Te Reo. Um, some policies are very draconian, uh, very um, uh, out of date where. If you want to write in Te Reo, you have to give, um, you have to write to and give notice to your head of department that you intend to write this, this essay in Te Reo and you have to give them notice. It's just like crazy, really, 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 really crazy, crazy. So that's been, you know, those things have been challenged now. And um, because the deal is official, then, you know, you can, it, it, yeah, not all universities have, uh, have that um, facility either. 
in New Zealand. So it's only those of us who are bolshy enough to and you know to to argue a position and to um uh and to fight for that um that that status. It's really important, yeah, to know that. But uh, normalization has to be yes, yes, yes. But I'm all for I'm all for the the transformation, the revolution of you know little all right in Te Māori and increase the number of um of uh, people around the globe that can assess in Te Reo Māori, Cook Islands. I'm talking about Te Reo Māori because uh, that's just just be fantastic, you know. Um, give me a placard. I'll I'll uh, do whatever you need me to do to go wave that placard. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think, um, yeah. 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 Kia ora, Tanya. Kia ora, Tato Katoto. Te roka nei mato i te tika ti akoi. Ko taao i oro mai taao api. Ko runga i te i taao i rawe. Te tua o te Māori te reo Māori nui e te tai o pai api o te tua o te reo Māori. Ia ko te mato. Okay, do you know what I me tengo mato no todo tiempo, e no mato y no le pone a caro mato y tal y oro oro mai y oro oro mai que mato. Me tengo que mato. Kia ora. Kia ora, it's been a privilege and thank you for that and um, thank you for your acknowledgement and I wish you every success with your learning and your class, <coughs> your diploma. And um, uh, and send you my, you know, all my aroa to to uh, the cooks <coughs> and to your well being. And hopefully, um, with we may be we may be able to see one another um, come, later, come. later in the year when the borders we have no quarantine. You know, yes. this uh, this person doesn't have three thousand two hundred dollars to come back into quarantine. And um, you know, I, I need a non quarantine uh, way to yeah. travel. So yeah. So anyway, good luck and thank you again, Debbie. I don't know. I can. I know you're there. Uh, again, thank you for reaching out. Uh, it's a really honor. It's an honor, you know, to to do to do something like this. And if there's another time, always count me in. So um, if I can be of any use to you, I hope this has been valuable. And um, to you, and you've learned something, and uh, that uh, you know, uh, there's an opportunity for us to to uh, to join together this way, or if not, in then in person um, in the future. So yeah, I will. I will. Bye. 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 Bye.